Hi guys and welcome back to my classics series. Today I'm going to be discussing something that I love talking about and thinking about in relation to classics which is morality and today I'm going to be focusing on 19th century literature which is of course my favourite. I love it and I think it's a time when morality was such a big issue. So morality is definitely such a big topic that it's going to take more than one video. So as I read more and as I think about other books you'll see more videos about this topic but other topics too relating to different periods of literature. Morality is just a small part of it. So I'm going to get started with the five books I want to talk to you about today and the first one is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. This is one of those books that makes you think about morality a lot but at the time was quite a controversial book in the way that it discusses certain themes, particularly religious morality and what it means to be religious because of course Frankenstein is about a man called Dr Frankenstein who creates a monster, who literally creates new life and obviously that raises really big questions. Should life be created? How is life created? Is it something that we should intervene with? And I think that that is really interesting because in Frankenstein you get this difference between life and death. You have the creation of the monster which is creating new life and then you also have this destruction that the monster causes and so you have this difference in if we create life is it okay to take life away and from a modern perspective obviously these are really important things to discuss that we can discuss things like euthanasia and designer babies and things like that but of course right at the start of the 19th century those weren't issues at all they did not exist. I think the great thing about Frankenstein is that it really mirrors the scientific and philosophical progress of the day particularly when we consider something like whether Frankenstein's monster is a direct image or version of Frankenstein Frankenstein the creator's soul or morality. So when you think about something like the bad things that happen to Frankenstein as a consequence of him creating the monster, is this some kind of divine force looking down on him and ruling that he has done something wrong so these bad things must happen to him? And you put the consequences in place and I think that's a really interesting thing to think about, not just from a contemporary point of view but from a modern perspective as well. Without mentioning any spoilers, I think the ending reflects this too and a really big thing for me when looking at morality is how the books end. Are they ended on a positive note? If so, then we have to look at just how immoral those books were viewed because if a bad thing happens then you can say as an action of your immorality then this has happened to you, these are the consequences of being immoral. And those books can then be viewed as a way of putting people in their place and teaching them a lesson in morals. One of those books that I think was perhaps viewed as immoral or coarse because of its ending, how it ends on quite a positive note, is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, which is a spectacular book about a woman who runs away from her husband, she takes her son and flees because he is abusive, he's an alcoholic, he treats her appalling and has affairs and this is something that is really detailed in the book in quite graphic detail and that is pretty much unheard of in Victorian Britain. The Victorians were very hot on morality and I'm going to explore it more in the series looking further back at particularly love poetry in like the 15 and 1600s when the language that we used was very different to how it is in the Victorian period. Even a hundred years earlier when you get something like Tristram Shandy which opens up with his conception. You get this quite open atmosphere regarding sexuality and then as soon as you get to the Victorian period and the start of the 19th century you get this change, this feeling that you have to stay in line, you have to be moral, you have to be religious and this is how you must be. When it was first published The Tenant of Wildfell Hall was called one of the coarsest books which we ever perused and one reviewer warned lady readers not to look at it and talks of the profane expressions in conceivably coarse language and revolting scenes and descriptions by which its pages are disfigured. Pretty much all of the Bronte books were called coarse except from something like Agnes Grey and I think that's really interesting because Agnes Grey is a very moral book and Agnes follows a very specific path, she is very religiously involved and then you get The Tenant of Wildfell Hall and it's like Anne has written a completely different book, it's like she's taken on a new character and is writing from a completely different perspective perspective and I think that's really good because Anne is often viewed as the quiet meek sister who we don't know a lot about 
But actually, she was a trailblazer for her day and the Tenant of Wildfell Hall has been called one of the first feminist texts. There's a scene in the book, without mentioning any specific details, where she slams a door in her husband's face and I've heard one critic describe it as the moment that modern feminism was born and I love that. I love seeing Anne as this figurehead for change because the Tenant of Wildfell Hall catalogues something that was happening a lot but actually in popular culture and in terms terms of the literature that was being written it's not something that people want to read about because they feel like it's going to give people ideas and it's going to make them go out of their way to do immoral things. And The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is set at a time when women couldn't own their own property. As soon as they married, everything belonged to their husband. And you do see that changing as the century progresses and new laws come in. One of those books where you start to see a tiny change in the way that women are treated in marriage is The Woodlanders by Thomas Hardy, which is a book that I have recently read and really love. It's not one of Thomas Hardy's most popular books, but I don't really know why, because I think the things that he discusses in it are fantastic. This is about a woman called Grace Melbury and her father has pledged that she's going to marry this man called Giles Winterbourne who I love and she is pretty much set on this fruit and then she meets a man called Dr Fitzpiers and a little romance gets going between them. It deals with adultery and desertion but I actually feel like it's one of Thomas Hardy's more light-hearted books even though really sad horrible things happen in it. I think that in fact this is another one where the ending reflects how you have to stay in your lane in Victorian Britain, you can't be too controversial, you have to, even though you may have done bad things or done something that's out of the ordinary, in the end you still got to stick to your morals and I think that is a reflection of this. The thing that I find fascinating about the Woodlanders is the discussion on the new marital laws which happened in 1857 which granted new powers to people and made it easier to divorce and actually it was still sexist because men could gain divorce easier but it still gave women the ability to do it and it would change again as the century progressed. The thing about the Woodlanders though is that the main character Grace is in a very privileged position in which she has a lot of money, she's had a good education but Thomas Hardy also changes this and I think that he deals with working class narratives really well in Tessa the Durbervilles and the consequences of not having a good education and the way that that might take you, particularly in Victorian Britain when you didn't get an education, there was no kind of education available to you, particularly with Tess, and so the decisions that Tess makes are very different to the ones that Grace makes in The Woodlanders. They're quite similar books, but I wouldn't say that they are very similar, but I feel like Grace could have taken the path that Tess takes if she wasn't maybe as educated or didn't really know what she was doing and Tess has a lot of potential in Tess the Durbervilles and Tess the Durbervilles is all really about making one mistake and how that changes your life forever because Tess has a child out of wedlock and you're not really sure in the book whether it is rape or not um, that is something that's quite ambiguous and something that I discussed a lot in like my English literature classes. People really aren't sure because part of Thomas Hardy as well is that he's writing a lot of the time for an audience where it's going to be serialised and so you have to censor it in some ways. He can't be as open as he would be writing now, writing exactly the same book. You could lay it out on the line. He has to kind of skirt around the issues and that is another form of moral censorship censorship in the fact that you can't publish something that is really outlandish and really out there even though people know what you mean you can't directly mention it. The subtitle of Tesla D'Urbervilles is A Pure Woman which is a bit of commentary from Thomas Hardy to say what he really thinks about Tess. It talks about her losing her virginity and having this child out of wedlock and how does that make her unpure? Does that somehow make her less of a person? And you also have this kind of heritage in there in which Tess is supposed to be descended from the famous D'Urbervilles and how you have this social and political history and it all combines to really disadvantage Tess and prove 
that she just hasn't had the right opportunities in life to guide her in the right way and she's got a lot of family forces pushing down on her and pressuring her into doing certain things and it's just all very confusing for Tess and I really like the way that Thomas Hardy writes about it in Tess of the D'Urbervilles. And then the final book I want to talk to you about is one that is a really interesting book in terms of discussing morality and it is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. The thing I want to discuss about this, even though I could discuss so many other aspects, is homosexuality and YouTube is probably going to automatically demonetize this video for that but oh well we're going to discuss it anyway. The Picture of Dorian Gray is about a man called Dorian who is very beautiful, very stunning, some kind of Adonis and his two friends called Basil and Lord Henry and this is pretty much your 19th century LGBT love triangle going on here. It's fascinating to read about and it has to be very coded. I actually did my English literature coursework on this and compared it with Mrs Dalloway in terms of of homosexual representations and attitudes in the day and how everything had to be very coded and how you go from the picture of Dorian Gray at the end of the 19th century and then you go to Mrs Dalloway about 20 or 30 years after and a lot has changed in the way that these relationships can be written about. You do get these clues thrown in such as Wilde referring to Roman homosexual figures who Dorian is compared to and there is some very obvious stuff in there but actually I think, I don't know if this is the version that I read, but it actually had to be changed slightly from when it was serialised to when it was published because it was just seen as too immoral. The Picture of Dorian Gray is really interesting as an immoral book because it was used against Oscar Wilde in the trial when he was up for homosexual acts and he was thrown in prison for it and it was used as a way to show his immorality and really it is the final nail in Oscar Wilde's coffin. He dies about 11 years after The Picture of Dorian Gray is published in exile in Paris never to return to England. He just doesn't want to be involved with anything to do with England again because it's treated him so so appallingly and so he flees to France and that is where he dies. So morality isn't just something that is written about, it's something that affects the authors too and reflects on them as people and as writers and creators and so really I mean Charlotte Bronte is a good example here. She spent a lot of her time trying to get away from this coarse label in Jane Eyre and so she wrote Shirley which didn't exactly work but once you get to something like Villette when she wrote it it's actually praised and seen as her best work because it isn't immoral anymore and so you get this censorship and some authors try and escape that and some embrace it. Thomas Hardy actually wrote more books but in the end, because they were so criticised, he stopped writing novels altogether and wrote poetry. And I think that immorality and morality is such an important discussion to have in terms of censorship and how we view books and how they were viewed then and how they were viewed now. And there's so much more I could talk about and so many other books that I could discuss. So I'm definitely going to do that soon. So thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you guys soon. Happy reading!